right, so our next speaker is one of the more silent partners in the Hackaday family. Uh, since Hackaday was acquired by SupplyFrame, we've had the opportunity to do some amazing stuff like the Hackaday Prize, contests, conferences, and something that's just as important, really increasing the quality of what we publish. One of the most visible aspects of this is our fantastic illustrations for the blog, our other web stuff, and uh, our print publications. Just about all of these are done by Joe Kim. He's the creator of the tin cute Tindy robot dog, our CRT head mascot. Not a head mascot, it's a CRT head robot head mascot. And hundreds of other illustrations. Uh, right now he's gonna be talking about the relationship of technology and art and how technology pushes art to new levels. He's also the only guy in the office with one of those sweet Wacom tablets. So please welcome to the stage, Joe Kim. Hello. How's everyone doing today? Uh, well, my name is Joe Kim. I am an art director at Hackaday and Supply Frame. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, the balance of art and technology. So being an artist at a tech company, I'm constantly surrounded by really intelligent people doing really interesting things, writing intricate code, data scientists, sciencing data, and I'm in my area drawing uh, poop, fighting Roombas, <laughs> or imagining what a joust would look like on Mars, and even Edison and Tesla in a grand wizard battle. <laughs> Thanks. But what it's also made me look at is kind of how technology affects the work I'm doing today. Um, so technology has always been a part of art. We've always been creating new tools, to make the process of art more faster, more efficient, kind of pushing art to the next level. And without it, you know, we'd still you know, be painting in caves. But fortunately, uh, humans don't know when to stop with the creations. And so we just keep pushing. And then we end up in the Renaissance, where we figure out lenses. And they're creating camera obscura rooms, where um, whatever the light hits gets projected upside down into a dark room and therefore artists can draw exactly what they're about to paint. Uh, people keep pushing, keep pushing, and we end up in the digital age where we have this now amazing thing called Photoshop. And, but the thing is, uh, Photoshop is just a tool still. I can give Photoshop to my two-year-old daughter, and what she's gonna do is make a two-year-old drawing, except it might have really cool colors because she doesn't even know how to mix paint or like choose great colors. Um, but with this technology, you're actually, tr people are starting to push the artist out of the art and they're focusing more on the tech than the art itself. Um, and so how I wanna talk about this is go over two different kinds of art. Uh, the first one, is one that we're probably most familiar with and what we uh, participate in the most, uh, photography. We all have smartphones, or I'm sure most of us have smartphones, and with that comes a great camera. You know, these Apple and what all Samsung, all of them make these amazing uh, lenses that can create like National Geographic type photos. Uh, but before the digital age happened, we had analog photography in which we had these classic images. Um, I'm sure they're iconic, everybody knows them. And in order, but in order to create something like this, it was more than just clicking and then like saving it on your camera roll. You had to go through a whole long process, almost like a science experiment, just to create one image. So I'll, let's just kind of go over what that used to mean. Um, in the beginning, you have uh, these tangible things called rolls of film, which I'm sure barely any of us know what those are anymore. And you take that out of camera, you put it in with some chemicals, you shake it up, and then you give it some more uh, chemical baths. And then next step, you gotta wash out the chemicals, roll it out, and hang it and dry it. And after that, you can only choose a couple frames of that film you want because it's gonna take a long time to just make one of those images. And so the person, the photographer, has to have that eye to know what's gonna work and what's not, or you're just wasting a bunch of time. Uh, after that, 
you project it onto your, uh, your, your, your photo paper. And this, at this point, the, uh, the photographer kind of decides what value scale is going to work best. And so even after the photo is done, there's a lot of craft, there's a lot of care going into this process. There's a lot of knowing exactly what's going to work, uh, having that eye. So once you decide exactly which one of these works, you take the developed photo, you give it more bath, and then you finally have your final photograph. And that whole process, just for one image. Now, if that whole process was, uh, you had to do that whole process just for an image that you take on your phone, like, nobody would really try to do that anymore. And um, in order to create something like this, you have to have a dark room, which is thousands of dollars of equipment, huge space, special lighting. It's just a lot, a lot for people nowadays. And instead, now with technology and Photoshop, we just, everything's just right here. You know, you, all the tools that, analog tools that you had, you, people created, they have them in the digital form. But again, technology doesn't know when to stop. So we keep pushing, we keep pushing. It's too complicated, we need to make it more simple. And then we end up with this. Uh, filters that, again, you don't need the eye, the, the artist's eye to know what works. You just, oh uh, yeah, like, Amaro looks good today. Let's just, let's just click on that. And it's good enough. Uh, and then, uh, but then you, you know, it's fine, I guess, you know. And then you, <laughs> but back in the day, we had real artists, uh, you know, hopping up on cars with their huge cameras, trying to get that perfect photo. And now we have this, uh, this is what our phones and our cameras are used for the most. Now I'm 36, I caught the tail end of analog photography, um, and never have I ever seen anybody come back from a vacation and show me a picture of their food. Never, I, I highly doubt it's ever been developed on actual film before. Um, but, you know, people realize there's something going wrong with this whole process. And so uh, a little resurgence of the analog has come back, um, uh, thanks to very special people called hipsters. And, you know, they're good for something, I guess. Uh, and so, but it's great. It's, it's, again, they're putting the art back into, uh, the artist back into the art. Uh, and that you need that balance, or you're just going to have plates of food you know, just all over your photo albums. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about uh, is movie posters and screen prints. So even like far back in the past, we uh, created ads, huge posters for any sort of grand shows, any sort of special events. Um, and that tradition has continued today with, our, uh, with cinema and film. Uh, you might recognize Toulouse Lautrec, a uh, very famous artist. Um, you probably saw some of his work in like your college apartment or maybe your local Mimi's Cafe. Uh, you have my favorite artist, Muka. These are uh, images that he created for plays. Of, his, uh, of a special actor that he worked with. Uh, and then technology keeps uh, progress, print technology keeps progressing. And then you end up with classic movies. Uh, King Kong, Attack of the 50 Foot Woman, beautifully hand painted photos, or not photos, paintings, that um, using print technology you're able to mass produce. Uh, you go on, you get more stylized with Saul Bass, very you know incredible art. So, um, and then screen printing technology catches on, off, offset printing catches on, and you're able now to uh, use uh, special type. You're not doing hand type anymore. There's letterpress. You can, and you're able to recreate more details in the paintings. Um, Bond, Into the Dragon, these are like, in the art world, you know, art nerds go crazy over this stuff. Um, Star Wars classic, again, we're just progressing, things are getting better, actor likenesses are getting better, and then we get to uh, probably the godfather of, uh, 
uh, movie poster art, Drew Struzan. Uh, you've probably seen some of his work. Uh, he's done you know, all the classic Back to the Future paintings, uh, Indiana Jones, uh, Big Trouble in Little China. These are all hand-painted uh, using mixed media, airbrush, color pencil, and then along with uh, print technology, they're able to you know, put the letters, put the titles and type on it, and you end up with beautiful pieces of art that are still sought after. Uh, but then, of course, comes Photoshop. Uh, Photoshop, uh, the marketing people say, hey, you know what? They have this new tool now. It's, uh, you can get these, the likeness is perfect. It's faster. You don't have to sit there and wait for an artist to try to like, draw all these little details and everything. It's in a photo. And so we, that whole uh, era begins. Goodfellas, Titanic, you know, it's, you can kind of see the um, progression and the, the uh, what he took from this kind of art and just added, made it in Photoshop. And Photoshop gets better. So now you're not only doing like easy fades, you're, you can have explosions behind the guy and, you know, kind of make these collages even better, almost exactly like a Drew Struzan painting, but with the exact likenesses, and it's probably way faster to create. But again, we don't know when to stop with this. Uh, you take the art out of the art, and you end up with unoriginal ideas, a lot of repetition, and then you end up with these. Uh, the classic, you know, back to the viewer, maybe looking back, saying, what's up? Um, you, you know, the, in between the leg shots, because legs are cool, I guess. Uh, then, you know, the back to back, you know, look at this guy right here. Yeah, it's, again, you take the art, and you, you just, you know, I'm sure they just got like these 19 year old interns who knew how to use Photoshop to like throw these together real quick, because why spend money on that? Uh, it's not art to them, it's just a marketing tool. Uh, and then not only do you get unoriginal ideas, you begin to get people who don't really know how images work. Uh, for example, you have Harry Potter on the left here in which there's a train door in front of him, but yet his head is in front of the frame of the door. Uh, that doesn't totally make sense. Uh, most recent thing is this Tomb Raider. Uh, it, the anatomy, you can tell she was kind of put together by two different photos by the anatomy of her neck. It's a little long. It looks more like a Bojack Horseman poster than Alicia Vikander, you know. But, uh, so again, people start to realize this. People start to realize something is wrong with this. Uh, and then the hipsters start coming in and say, hey, let's, let's take it back a little bit. So uh, very fam or a famous uh, uh, theater in Austin, Texas, one of the home of the hipsters, uh, called Alamo Draft House, and a company called Mondo. They, they threw together a film festival in which they made these screen print posters, uh, influenced by Saul Bass, but they're beautiful. They, they, they show the, the movie in simple form. No actors are shown and it's incredible art. Uh, it takes off so much that a little swell of an underground screen print culture begins, and they continue to have these screenings in which uh, they have Star Wars, they start to gather these artists um, to create uh, beautiful uh, screen prints. Uh, you go on. And like this underground culture has begun to swell, and it's it's really really cool. It's really big now, uh, and the the studios have begun to notice this. They begin to say, "Why is they see this? They see how much money these people are making, and they say, wait, that's money we could be making.' So then they begin to make their own kind of you know these are actual posters for the Wolverine film uh, in 2013." Uh, these were kind of limited release posters. Not many people saw them because I'm sure there was a big Photoshop version with the actors' heads and stuff. Uh, 
And then they continued to say, hey, like, this actually got a lot of good reaction. And they kept going till now. These few films have come out. These are the actual movie posters um, for these big films. Uh, that They actually use the same artists from uh, Alamo Drafthouse and the Mondo collaborations. And uh, we have uh, Rory Kurtz and James Jean are the last two. Uh, they're beautiful. Again, they began to bring back the artists back into the art. These are hand painted, but also they use photo, Photoshop retouching to get it exactly what they want. So again, it's a collaboration of the art and technology. But with that right balance, you can create something amazing like this instead of creating people between legs and just going back to that generic, um, that generic kind of style. So uh, pretty much like what I want to really say is that as long as we have that balance, we know that uh, technology keeps pushing art to the next level. But to a point, it becomes where we're just creating a more efficient way to make bad art. Uh, when you bring it back, take a step back a bit where we're at now, I think we can continue to make great stuff. That's it. Thank you.